This is a standalone virtual reality headset. This is a standalone augmented reality headset. And this is a standalone virtual reality and augmented reality headset in one. It's called the Lynx R1 and I, along with Sebastian from MRTV, was lucky enough to be invited over to the Lynx offices in Paris to try the early in-development versions of this incredibly promising headset. While there we met Stan and Shuki from Lynx who ran us through a number of mixed reality AR demos in order to show us exactly what the R1 is capable of when playing into its strengths. The hardware of the R1 is now finalised and in place, so Lynx's efforts are now focused around building a software stack to open up and make usable the various functions of the headset. Partially for this reason, we were unable to try every aspect of the functionality of the headset, focusing primarily on 6 degrees of freedom, mixed reality, hand tracking based demonstrations during this visit. However, there was definitely enough shown here to convince me more than ever that what Lynx are offering is something unique at this moment in time, and it is absolutely something I'll be following very closely. So with that, let me get into some of my impressions of the Lynx R1. Immersed Robot when you imagine the offices of a tech startup, this is exactly what springs to mind. The offices are bright, cluttered, and filled with VR headsets, AR headsets, and dismembered components from various stages of the R1's development. It's exactly what I was expecting, and it didn't disappoint. When we arrived, Stan gave a tour of the office, informing us that we were free to film and record anything we see. The transparency, honesty, and enthusiasm of Stan was immediately present, and it definitely shows a level of confidence in what they're creating at Lynx. We were shown various calibration tools for the headsets, the limitations of their current equipment and their plans to resolve some of these limitations by leaning on their relationship with Qualcomm to finely tune some of the components, primarily the display calibration which I'll get to shortly. We also saw various prototypes and the exposed heart of the headset which revolves around the same XR2 chip which resides in the Oculus Quest 2. The other specs of the R1 are a display resolution of 1600 by 1600 per eye, a 90 degree field of view, 128 gigabytes of storage, expandable with micro SD card up to 1 terabyte. Integrated battery mounted on the rear of the headset providing 3 hours of use, a flip up front display with a small adjustable eye relief, full colour AR pass through cameras with 15 milliseconds of latency and integrated ultra leap hand tracking. When compartmentalising and comparing some of the specs on paper with a similar device such as the Quest 2, as people are inevitably going to do, it's easy to notice some of the numbers being slightly lower on the R1, the display resolution being the obvious one. However, to focus on certain raw specs like that completely ignores some of the incredible extra functionality the R1 offers, and even might be missing the point of this headset entirely. I hope to describe why I consider that to be the case during this video. But getting back on track, we were shown a number of demos, one of which had only been conceived of and created the night before is arriving. We were also the first to try certain functionality of the headset, namely the combination of colour AR pass-through, 6 degrees of freedom movement and hand tracking at the same time. As mentioned, certain aspects of the software are still being developed and require third party collaboration with Qualcomm, Ultra Leap and others, but fortunately this functionality had been worked on during the days leading up to our visit and it was working extremely well. We first tried a simple 3D drawing application very much in the style of Tilt Brush. It used hand tracking very effectively and flipping over my left hand revealed a menu where I was able to see colours, then I simply pinched the air in front of me and began drawing. If you've ever used Tilt Brush in a VR headset then you understand the effect of creating something in the space before you and walking around it to observe it from different angles. But the fact I was drawing these digital creations within the actual space of the room I was in took things to another level. The rendered objects when set against the pass through feed of the Lynx offices felt solid and locked in place. There was very little movement, delay or latency. There was no sensation of transparency in the objects that you might experience in optical AR devices such as the Magic Leap 1 or HoloLens due to the advantages of pass-through AR, being able to more convincingly create the illusion. Another experience we tried was based around experimenting with VR and AR transitions, something that this headset really shines in. When starting the experience I found myself completely enveloped in what seemed to be a VR representation of the solar system, with space surrounding me. By using the hand tracking I could reach out and grab the sun, then knock it into some of the planets, but it was only when you take a few steps to the side that the real magic hits, and I suddenly found myself back within the Lynx offices, still holding the digital sun in my fingers 
fingertips, having carried it from the virtual world to the real world. It was in these moments that the true value of all the different aspects of the R1 coming together really showed me the magic. Sebastian captured this when showing through the lens footage of this exact moment, which I'll show here because it illustrates the point really well. I'm going to take the sun and I'm going to put it somewhere else here. And this is the beautiful thing now. This is the office. And I can put my hand behind the sun and it's completely occluded. And you cannot... Now during these demos, a number of issues were made apparent at this early stage. The primary one is the white balance and lighting issues of the pass through feed. While not hugely distracting, it's certainly noticeable that as you move around your environment, the colors and background noise of the feed can alter. The result of this means that it takes you slightly out of the experience, reminding you once again that you are seeing a video feed. But this is absolutely a known problem and simply requires further software calibration. Based on what I heard from Stan regarding this issue, which he actually mentioned before I even brought it up, this should be a completely solved problem at launch. Another small issue was the hand tracking calibration at the time we used the headset, although in all honesty I didn't notice this until once again Stan informed me about it, but there is a slight offset with the hand tracking which still needs to be refined. These are both issues at the time of our demo and certainly worth mentioning, but I would in no way consider these to be a huge problem with the final product. So I can honestly say that the demos were impressive, especially considering the continuing work in refining the device over the coming months. But to make it clear about what we were shown, these demos are simple and early. It's plain to see that everything we were shown were designed to show the strengths of this headset, which is no bad thing. Just like the first time I tried simple and early VR demos, it's very easy to start imagining some of the incredible experiences and use cases developers could create for the Lynx platform. The AR and mixed reality potential of the device is really exciting to me. Replacing some of the use cases of a laptop or a tablet with the Lynx headset is an extremely interesting concept. Floating windows, web browsing, media players all existing alongside a potentially fully featured standalone VR headset should make this a solid purchase for any VR and AR enthusiast. And not forgetting we're in a time where the Vive Flow exists, a much more limited device in terms of functionality which is priced the same as the Lynx R1 pledge on Kickstarter. But it's only right to address some of the concerns people have around this project. The main question that I've been hearing around is content. What will you do with this device when you receive it? As mentioned previously, the focus at Lynx seems to have been primarily around creating a solid piece of hardware with incredible specs when you take everything into consideration. Low latency, full color pass through, integrated ultra leap hand tracking, and a ridiculously small form factor. But my discussions with Stan and Shuki made it clear that now is the time to focus on software and that is exactly what they have planned. They are in discussions with many developers to bring titles to the Lynx platform while also working on some integrated apps which should be available at launch. Things like media viewing, web browsing, etc. should be present in the device when you get it. I believe there will also be a developer platform where users can download demos of experiences as developers publish them. There is also the fact that developers could very easily port software titles from the Quest platform to the Lynx platform since they share the same architecture. And this is also something being actively discussed with developers. Beyond this, Lynx are also working towards OpenXR, which should arrive in early December, opening up a wealth of content on the headset. The app delivery system and store are still in discussions, but Stan has assured us that a store will be in place for users to download content for the headset at launch. One of the other concerns I see in reference to the Lynx R1 is light leakage when it's being used as a VR headset. This can easily be dismissed due to the included facial interface, which basically cushions the face so it behaves in exactly the same way as a standard VR headset. So this really isn't any concern whatsoever. The controllers are also mentioned a lot, and unfortunately we were unable to try these during our visit. Lynx are using Finch technology to design their own controllers for use with the headset. The controllers will be six degrees of freedom of course, and have a thumbstick. These are still a little early so I can't comment too much on them but the team are definitely listening to commentary regarding the controllers so hopefully they will keep us updated on the progress. The tracking of the controllers will be based on hand tracking for translation, positional movement and rotational movement will be based on the integrated IMUs. So before I talk too long on this headset, and believe me I could mention a million other things, I think it's best to start to wrap things up in terms of just being practical. So who should purchase this headset? 
The simple fact is that in terms of price and value for a standalone VR headset, the Quest 2 will always be an attractive proposition. To compare the links to the Quest on that single, narrow VR point of view almost feels like a mistake to me, it feels like cheating. Having tried the Lynx R1, having tried all the extra functionality it offers, it seems like taking on the Oculus Quest on the Quest terms is a battle based on nonsense. The flexibility and extra functionality offered by the Lynx is something that shouldn't be ignored, but there is something else that I'll get into that separates this headset from the Quest in just a second. The truth is, if all you want is a standalone VR headset to stream Steam VR games, then the Quest 2 will probably still be my recommendation, solely based on price. But if you understand and are receptive to the incredible potential of AR mixed reality content, while also having the flexibility available to play standalone and PC based VR content, then the answer is clear, the Lynx R1. So there is little doubt that the Quest 2 is a fantastic VR headset, but the big caveat to all of this however comes down to one word, a word which might very well change in the near future, Facebook. This video isn't going to be the place to get into data concerns, privacy concerns and all the other baggage that comes along with picking up a device made by Facebook, but it's certainly the place to highlight the fact that people have some genuine issues with the company. I rarely get into these problems on my channel and I don't want to dwell on them now, but something that absolutely separates Lynx from their most direct and often referenced competitor is that Lynx have zero interest in user data. Lynx are a product company and for anyone who has even the slightest issue regarding future privacy and data concerns and are not wanting to happily slide down the ever more slippery slope of Facebook's domination of the market, then they should look towards companies like Lynx as not only a viable alternative, but in many ways one ahead of the curve. So to wrap up, I was extremely impressed with what Lynx have achieved at this point, especially with a small team of 15 people at this time. There are questions that remain in terms of app delivery and controller performance to name a few, but I backed the Kickstarter before I made my visit to the Lynx offices and my pledge will remain. I have confidence that they will deliver. If there will be a delay or not, I can't say because that seems par for the course with Kickstarter, but Stan and Shuki's confidence during our visit made me happy with my pledge at this time. Having an in-person meeting with people who are obviously passionate about their product conveys a level of reassurance which really makes this visit worthwhile in my mind. There will always be questions and uncertainties but I can honestly say I left happy with my pledge. We'll see what happens with Lynx as they progress and get closer to the delivery deadline and I don't have a crystal ball. My commentary here is entirely based on honest feedback of a very interesting visit. But let me know what you think, we spent a long in-depth day with Stan and Shuki discussing many aspects and I can't include absolutely everything in this video, but if you have any questions then I'll be happy to answer them in comments. More than anything, I hope this video might be useful for anyone thinking of backing the Lynx Kickstarter or not. The link for the Kickstarter page is in the description below if you'd like to support them there. But with that, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Please consider supporting Immerse Robot on Patreon, or joining the Discord, or following me on Twitter, or better yet, all of the above. Links in the description below.